Before we start today's show, we want to invite you to stick around at the end of the episode to enjoy a preview of a new podcast that premieres on July 14th. As the industry's exclusive cannabis podcast network, MJ Bulls is proud to present Women Leading in Cannabis. Join host Kira Reed each week for inspirational discussions with women who are leading the cannabis industry. Everybody and welcome to the Deadhead Cannabis Show. This is Jim Marty, reporting from sunny and warm Lamont, Colorado. I'm out in my barn, and it's a blue sky day in the mid '80s. Beautiful day here. How's things in Chicago, Larry? Jim, everything is nice here as well. It's a uh, beautiful sunny day. Uh, we're heading into the summer, and very excited about it. Uh, as of today, we are officially entering phase three in Illinois, which means that the shelter at home order is expiring. We can start congregating outside in groups of 10 or less. Um, and I'm taking that as a good sign that we're well on our way to recovery. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to be optimistic and hope that that means maybe by the fall, we can still get a couple of shows in while it's nice outside. Wishful thinking, maybe. Well, certainly hope so. I had lunch at my favorite restaurant yesterday. It was their opening day. And, um, Lots of social distancing, very limited menu, but I knew what I wanted. I I didn't need a menu, and I had a wonderful lunch. So, yeah, things are getting back to normal here in Colorado, too. Yeah, that big question is when can we uh, get together in in groups of five or 10,000 or go to see a ball game? I'm I'm dying to see a Rockies game. Yeah, baseball, everything. I agree. It's uh, it's kind of weird because I was talking about it with some of my friends. And, you know, we're at the time of year now where – uh, you know, quite frankly, baseball would really be starting to get interesting two months into the season, right? You know, now all of a sudden the teams that are going to play good ball are, are kind of asserting themselves. And uh, this is right around the time when, you know, everybody's going to, on their concert tours. Memorial Day weekend really kicks off a lot for a lot of people. Uh, we had tickets to go to lock-in in June this year. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're heading full steam into that period of time when we would be out doing things that we don't get to do. And, you know, we can uh, hope that by the end of the summer, maybe uh, we'll see what happens. And um, certainly by this time next year, I'd like to think that we're back to normal and, you know, all the things that are traditionally happening now are in fact happening. Yeah. Some of the things that um, I've been listening to and learning about is, um, you know, once you're in a baseball stadium or an outdoor arena, like Red Rocks, it's not a problem to social distance if they sell half the tickets. The issue is, you know, that you have the funnels of people coming in and leaving the show. And when five or 10,000 people leave at once, then there's a lot of um, you don't really uh, social distance when you're in the tunnels and exits and entrances to uh, the venues that you and I love so much. It's a, it's a great idea, Jim, if we could get people to follow some of the basic rules we learned in elementary school when we'd have the big uh, all school conferences. And at the end, uh, they'd have a thing that, okay, everybody on the left-hand side, row one, you can exit row two, you can exit row, you know, and if if people would follow those instructions, that would be great. Right. And I don't think it's going to be an issue selling half as many tickets because there's a lot of people out there who are very concerned about their immune systems. They're not ready to get on an airplane or go to a restaurant or go to a baseball game or a rock concert. So it'll be interesting to see how the tickets sell. Now, um, here in Colorado, uh, the ski area that I work at, volunteer at Arapahoe Basin, opened this week, and uh, they sold out immediately. Uh, the, they have limited access, limited number of lift tickets, and um, you have to go on the website, pre-register. Uh, that's how our golf courses are working as well. I've been playing golf the last couple of Sundays, and you have to pre-register and social distance. But if you're the same family like me and my son – we can ride in a golf cart together. So, you know, we're learning how to deal with this uh, COVID virus. We're learning more and more every day. I think by fall we'll have it figured out. And fortunately, the hospitalizations 
and deaths, especially here in Colorado, on a very steep downtrend, and I think that's true nationally. I, I think you're absolutely right, but you'll have to forgive me because you had me at you're living in a city where you can go skiing one weekend and play golf the same weekend, and I just love that about Colorado. Yep, that's uh, what we call springtime in Colorado. Uh, May is my favorite month here. I usually ski every Saturday in May. Fantastic. Um, well, I wish I had more that I could tell you about what's going on in Illinois. You know, uh, we still, uh, and now at the end of May, still do not have a date uh, from the uh, Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation as to when we will hear about final results for the adult use dispensary application licenses, which uh, those uh, announcements were supposed to have been made as of May 1st. Uh, they've been pushed off with no new date. We still don't have a date. Um, and what the attorneys are doing is we're uh, conversing with one another and trying to figure out if anyone who has a client who's received a deficiency notice. Because if there's a deficiency notice out there, we know that they can't have an announcement until the, the, the deadline for responding to the deficiency notice expires. But that's kind of a rough way to have to do it. Now, in a sign that maybe they're getting close, uh, last week, at the end of the week, uh, the governor issued some new emergency rules for the program. And the centerpiece of those new rules talks about what happens in case there's a tie. Right. So they have if you're in the same district and, and, and they have three licenses and we have four people that all tie with the same score. How is that going to be resolved? That, that would be resolved by through the review of different parts of the, the, the work and effort that we put in. Uh, we were disappointed to find out that, in fact, uh, that tie is going to be resolved by nothing more fancy than pulling names out of a hat. Basically, a, a lot the a lotto system. Um, and you know, you get that far and then it comes down to pulling a name out of a hat. And while I realize at some point there has to be a tiebreaker, it seems a little frustrating to me to have to say to a client, well, we did a lot of work, cost a lot of money. We put out a great product. You clearly had one of the top applications in your group. Sorry, they didn't pull your name out of the hat. Wow. That's amazing. And like you said, by the, that point, they probably had a quarter to a half a million dollars invested in their li license application. Well, that's true. And, and I've had clients say to me now, because I've gone on it and started advising my clients of this, and some of them have said, hey, look, you know, it would have just been a lot better if on day one they said, okay, everyone who has $250,000 and doesn't have a bad uh, conviction on their record, sign up here and we'll put all your names in a hat. We'll just draw the winner right then and there. <laughs> that's funny. It would have saved a lot of trouble. Sad, but a little humorous. Well, outside of uh, the applications, for the people who actually are open, uh, and this is true apparently across the nation and in Canada, that the um, marijuana sales have been very strong during the pandemic. Uh, Colorado for April reported higher sales in 2020 than in 2019, and that is without our national holiday of 420. Uh, I also saw a ticker today come across my computer that uh, the Canadian public companies are having good sales and. Uh, their stock price is ticking up a Look, little bit. I, over the course of this pandemic, I have not heard negative cannabis business news from anywhere. All the news that we've heard has been positive. You and I talk about the numbers in Colorado being off the charts, the numbers in Illinois being off the charts, which isn't that new since it's all brand new. But nevertheless, launching, at least in this part of the world, a brand new adult use industry that within a month or two of it being launched, we all went into lockdown, and each month we sell more than the month before with a limited number of dispensaries available and a limited amount of product. Um, we will soon have 75 new dispensaries out there, and shortly after that we'll have another 40 cultivations, uh, uh, cultivation centers. So hopefully we'll, we'll get some of those issues worked out. Yeah, Illinois certainly needs more cultivation. Um, another interesting article I saw this week is what a powerful political force the cannabis industry has, bec industry has become. <clears throat> because we're really not a partisan uh, political group, but we are a very strong, pretty much a one issue um, constituency of you know, legal cannabis and safe banking and normal deductions. And so uh, you know, both sides of the aisle are um, very interested in having the support of the cannabis industry. And this article went on to say that um, you know, we can actually sway elections, uh, close elections. So you're seeing um, 
Republicans as well as Democrats reaching out and uh, reaching out to the cannabis industry. The new bill uh, includes the Safe Banking Act as well as some uh, normalization for IRS deductions. So we'll see if those provisions of the new, uh, I think they're calling it the HEROES bill. It's the fourth um, pandemic-related bill that's winding its way through Congress, like I said, out of the House, over to the Senate, uh, where it's getting a lot of attention, and especially the, the cannabis provisions. Certainly, there's some people against the cannabis provisions, but uh, they're there, and we've got uh, people like Cory Gardner and Elizabeth Warren, two extreme uh, polar opposites, politically pushing hard to get uh, the safe banking as part of the HEROES bill that's being considered right now. Well, Jim, you know, you and I, the, the constant theme we've brought to this show over time is the amazingness of how cannabis is a bipartisan issue. And the safe banking bill passed the House with that's right. strong bipartisan support. And, you know, it, it, when it gets put to a vote in the Senate, I have no doubt that it will once again show strong bipartisan support. This is an issue that defies red and blue, conservative, uh, liberal, uh, Republican, Democrat. It cuts across all lines, and that's because we're dealing with something that's basic, that's essential, not essential in that respect, but to some people it is, and, and, and a basic thing that, that we all like and we all want to take a part of. It's like we'd be like saying, do we have a political division over sugar? And the Trump administration has been, I wouldn't say they're very pro-cannabis, but they have not been anti-cannabis. And our Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, has said some very favorable things about the cannabis industry. Look, when I found out who some of these people are uh, uh, who wind up going to Grateful Dead shows, right, guys, uh, people who were very strong commentators on the right and, and, and took very strong positions on the right, and yet at the end of the day, they like to smoke marijuana. They like to go to Grateful Dead shows. And I love listening to Bill Maher because Bill Maher will find people who he disagrees with politically, but who agree with him on marijuana. They will have fascinating conversations. It's wonderful to listen to. Right. There's the whole personal liberty, uh, personal freedom side of the Republican side. There's the whole social justice um, argument that comes from the left. Yeah, I think I've said before on this show that politics makes strange bedfellows. That's true, and especially when you throw in marijuana, because everybody just likes to get high, and that's a great thing. And I really do believe that a lot of problems could be solved if people just sat down and smoked a joint together. You know, we remember when Obama was president, and they had beer gate between him and the, these these cops in Boston, and everybody talked about that. And we're just about ready for uh, doing that with a couple of joints and letting everybody just chillax a little bit and see where that takes us as a society. Yes. Yeah, it's been a rough week with the riots up in Minneapolis where my parent company uh, headquarters, uh, the terrible, tragic, some people call, calling it death, other people calling it a murder of the black man at the hands of the Minneapolis police. Um, so it's been a rough week for social justice. Yes. Um, you know, and uh, as a society, you know, we need to try to find ways to pull there and again. Uh, this always proves to be a great unifier for people. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, people will, uh, cooler heads will prevail and people will get their message out without harming others or harming property. Um, and that everyone, you know, will be able to find some common ground on which they can coexist. And if this helps people get there, then um, I'm all for it. I want to take a quick break to thank you for listening to today's show and to invite you to listen to all the other great MJ Bulls cannabis podcasts, like Raising Cannabis Capital, the show which features cannabis entrepreneurs that are raising money to expand their organization. Tune in each week on Thursdays and Sundays to hear founders of awesome cannabis companies talking about their business and their fundraising plans. Who knows? Maybe you'll discover the future Amazon or Apple of cannabis on the Raising Cannabis Capital podcast. Well, enough politics and business. Let's talk some music. I understand that you were able to find a clip of uh, the Red Rocks 2009 show of Character Zero from Fish. I did. And now, as I told you, um, and, and I hope our listeners will understand, 
um, I, I'm, I'm somewhat technologically inept when it comes to these things. So I just go to YouTube and whatever shows up on YouTube is, is what I find. And YouTube had a very grainy clip of, of that character zero. It only ran for just under two minutes, but within those two minutes, even on a grainy clip, here's what I surmised from it. For me, character zero is one of those songs that it seems like anytime I go to see fish, they play character zero. I'm the guy, if you want to see if they've done three shows in a row, show I go to is the show they're going to play it. So I have a little bit of a love hate relationship with the song, but overall I love it because it's a great tune and it's a wonderful percussion tune. And it's a great tune for Billy to sit in on. And I love the fact that they've got the two drum kits sitting right there next to each other. They're both playing. And every time they get to that part about boom, 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 boom. And you know, the two of them are having a ball back there. You can see. So here's my questions for you, Jim, if you were, did they have both drum kits set up? Did he sit in for the whole set or did he just come on for that one song? No, he set in for the whole second set. I think they set it up during set break. Okay. So he came in for the whole second set with them. That's amazing. That's just, that's fantastic. Um, and what it says to me, you know, on, on the one hand, some people might say, Oh, well, look, any drummer can sit in, but I don't think it's like that because, you know, Billy wasn't just sitting in, you know, if, if you're a drummer and you're out of sync with the beat of the song, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. Um, you know, and Billy was grooving with them right from the beginning and Fishman I was clearly having a ball with it, and Trey looked over his shoulder at them a few times, and that's the part that I love, right, is when you can see the guys on stage are having so much fun. Yes. When um, the set ended, um, Fishman stood up and he said, I love my extra drummer or something like that, and um, Billy gave us a bow and we gave him a big roar of approval. So that was a really fun show, and, of course, those were special shows because that was the first time uh, Fish had been back at Red Rocks since I believe 1997 or 96. So it was very nice that they got to come back to Red Rocks in 2009 post hiatus. They did four shows and I think I made it to all four. Um, very fun stuff. So, um, you know, speaking of great live performances, um, so I'm writing a book um, on how I helped make marijuana legal and I'm up to 2002, the first Bonnaroo, and I brought back my memory of one of the best widespread panic sets I've ever seen without it by far. And the, um, during, uh, the song tall boy, which has a big verse about the, the father, son, and the Holy ghost, Dottie peoples and the people's choice came out and just did a full gospel rendition right in the middle of that song of, of the father, son, Holy ghost, part of that song and Dottie Peoples is going, can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? It was just raise the hair in the back of your neck. It was so fabulous. So I encourage our listeners to check out the Bonnaroo 2002 and uh, widespread panic tall boy when Dottie Peoples sits in. Um, so that's one musical story I wanted to tell. And then um, I've continued to enjoy May 77. I've been listening to several of the shows. They're all very good. And, uh, yeah, that Ithaca show, um, very, very good. Um, you know, s some people say it's the best Grateful Dead show ever. And I'm listening to it. And I'm saying, yeah, it's pretty good. I just, I'm not really getting why it's the best show ever. And then I got to listen to the Morning Dew. And the Morning Dew is, is the most fabulous Morning Dew I think I've ever heard. Jerry gets at least two, possibly three extended solos, and he's just soaring, just soaring. You know, Jim, we've been talking for a long time about uh, the Barton Hall show and doing a deep dive into it. And uh, I went back and I listened to it again, uh, compliments of this wonderful pressing for the May 1977 box set that they put out. And the minute I heard the opening notes, my first thought was, oh, yeah, this is Ithaca. My whole uh, head career, when we all ran around with our box fulls of cassette tapes, one of my favorite shows was The Dead, Ithaca May 77. And I never really had called it Barton Hall or thought of it in terms of Barton Hall, but of course that's what it is. And, and the, the show was, was the, the, the background music of my college career. And, and going back and listening to it again, I understand why. It, 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 it is just a show. And you're right about The Morning Dew. I think that this show has to be graded in two sections, the entire concert and then the morning dew. 
which stands alone and tacked onto the end of any show would make that show a top 10 for most people. Um, but this is one of those shows where it was just interesting for me because they played, the set list is not outstanding by any means. It's a solid set list and it's got great, great tunes, but it's not like they pulled something special out or, or went somewhere that they had never gone before. It was just the way they played it. And they opened up with new mingle with blues and I, you know, it, it, it's a great version. It's like one of those versions where you say, wow, this might be an interesting show tonight just because they take a fairly ordinary tune and they give it a lot of oomph. And the entire first set, which is fairly standard dead stuff, nothing exciting, you know, uh, out of the ordinary, but just played so well. But it's the second set, right? And they have the, everybody take a step back and you can tell the crowd is all up at the front of the stage and they're all excited and ready to go. And then they blow into this scarlet fire that's, if people talk about the morning dew, I think it's a tremendous scarlet fire, one of the best I've ever heard. Um, a great estimated profit. And then they get to my favorite part of the show, which is the St. Stephen, not fade away St. Stephen sandwich, which is for me, you know, breaks up these tunes, makes them a lot of fun and always took them off on some great jams. And in fact, a couple of nights later on the same tour in New York city, in the middle of that, they did a St. Stephen, not fade away friend of the devil, not fade away St. Stephen. They took it one more layer deep, uh, which we always love to listen to as well. But this was just great. But then, of course, you get to the morning dew. And, you know, for deadheads who, who have listened to Jerry do morning dew, uh, it comes in one of two ways. Either it's kind of a perfunctory one that he throws on to the end of a show. And, you know, even a perfunctory one is still a great one. But when he's into it, when he really feels it, um, the whole crowd just can tell. And, and you're absolutely right. In this version of it, he's playing it. And you're like, OK, well, it's morning dew. That's great. But then as he gets the and he takes it from one level, the next level to the next Yep. Yeah. Well, I certainly um, enjoyed it very much. Um, and the previous show to Ithaca was the um, uh, Connecticut show, Hartford. And then after uh, Ithaca, they are at the Boston Garden. So I've been going through the whole box set, <clears throat> enjoying it all very much. <clears throat> but. Um, Check me out on this and see if I listen to it right. In the Ithaca show on the <coughs> Scarlet Fire, I think Jerry misses a verse. He misses the verse that says, if this is a business, I wish it for you. So anyway, um, I think we're coming to the end of our time slot. So it's been a very good show. Uh, enjoyed it very much. Always enjoy talking to Larry up in um, Chicago, Larry Michigan, great cannabis attorney. Uh, this is Jim Marty saying goodbye from beautiful Longmont, Colorado, and uh, we look forward to having you all back here next time. I'm Joy Beckerman, and I'd like to invite you to join me with my hemp industry leading guests on Hemp Baron. During my over a quarter century at the forefront of the hemp movement and emerging hemp economy, I've had the privilege of working with many of the world's most dynamic, innovative, trailblazing hemp pioneers. And now, every week, I have the honor of speaking with them and sharing their stories with you on Hemp Baron. You can download the latest episode every Wednesday at mjbulls.com or from wherever you listen to podcasts.
My name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.